what's going on in this passage? A couple of points we want to make. Number one, notice here, and this is very important, the context is Paul's exhortation to Timothy to offer universal intercession for all peoples. So the context is Paul is instructing Timothy and telling him, you can't be selective in who you pray for. You have to pray for everyone. So I'm urging you that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and interesting, thanksgivings, right? The Greek word here is eucharistia, be made for all men, for kings and all who are in high positions, right? So Paul's there. Notice Paul's instructing Timothy to offer universal intercession. And who in particular does he single out? Politicians. <laughs> so he's saying you have to pray for everybody, including kings and those in high positions, right? In other words, you need to pray for those who are in power. Now, in the first century AD, of course, who is in power? It's the pagans. It's the Romans. It's the emperor, right? It's the, the Caesars, right? Many of whom in the first century are wicked people, right? Like Gaius Caligula, one of the most, or, or Caesar Nero. These are not good people, right? And yet, Paul says that supplications and intercessions and thanksgivings be offered on their behalf. Right? So we see very clearly here, um, what I would argue is actually a, an implicitly liturgical context. Timothy is a young pastor. Paul's teaching him who to pray for, I would argue, in the context of the liturgy in particular. And I think that one of the reasons this is liturgical is the final verse when Paul says, I desire that in every place men should pray lifting holy hands. Right? This idea of consecrated hands being lifted up in prayer seems to suggest it's a congregational prayer that's being carried out here and with Timothy as the leader and Paul's teaching him to uh, pray for the leaders of the world. And we see this today, for example, in the contemporary lectionary and the prayers of the faithful, which will often be offered for public leaders, for pu public servants, for government officials, because this is what the New Testament teaches Christians to do to pray for their political leaders, whether those leaders are Christian or not, as they weren't in the first century AD. So that's the first content point. The context is universal intercession. Now, in that context, Paul also enjoins Timothy and other Christians to lead a peaceable and godly life, to be respectable in every way. So he's urging them to live within the Greco-Roman pagan society of their day in a way that's peaceful, right? And respectful in every way. And the reason he gives for this injunction for universal intercession is the universal salvific will of God, okay? So a lot of times when people read this next verse, they'll lift it out of its context, but it's important for us to understand it in context. So here Paul is basically giving the Christological and soteriological reason, the grounding for the universal intercession that Christians are called to engage in. Why should we pray for everybody? Why should we pray for the emperor when he's such a wicked or evil man? The reason is it is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So pause there. Here we see two key aspects of Paul's theology of salvation. First, it's universal. Jesus Christ does not just die for some people to be saved. He doesn't just die, say, for example, for the Jewish people to be saved. He dies so that all people can be saved. So God's will for salvation has a universal scope. There isn't anyone who's excluded from it. He even died for Nero. He even died for Caligula. He died for the most wicked pagan emperors there were as well as for sinners like St. Paul himself. It's a universal salvific will. Now, this is a little tricky in the Revised Standard Version here. It says, who desires all men to be saved. The Greek word is stello, so you'll also see it translated, who wills all men to be saved. The word thelo can be translated in English as, I want, I will, I wish, I desire. It expresses all those things. So God wills for all men to be saved but notice this, and not just to be saved, this is really crucial, but to come to a knowledge of the truth. So important. Sometimes we tend to reduce salvation purely to like eschatological life. 
In other words, am I going to make it to heaven or not? Do I go to heaven or do I go to hell? Like that's what salvation is. But for Paul, salvation is that. It is life in Christ as opposed to life outside of Christ. It is the bodily resurrection of the dead and all those things it, um, and escaping you know, the punishment of Gehenna. But it's more than that. Salvation involves knowledge of the truth. So Christ doesn't just die so that people might be saved. He dies so that people can know the truth. Because as Jesus says in the Gospel of John, you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Christ doesn't just want, God doesn't just want people to not go to hell. He wants them to be free, to have the freedom of the truth. Very important, I think, in our, especially in our day of, kind of relativism, where people say, you have your truth, I have my truth. No, 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 no. There's one truth, and, and that truth is a saving truth, and God desires not just that people should you know, escape from separation from him in damnation, but know the truth in Christ Jesus. And here, Paul continues, you'll notice the next line is very powerful. Why? For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony to which was born at the proper time. So pause here. This is interesting. One of the most fascinating things about Christianity is the paradox of its universal mission and its exclusive and absolute Christology and theology. So on the one hand, there's only one God and there's only one mediator between God and human beings, between God and humanity, right? And that one mediator is Christ Jesus. He's the sole mediator of salvation. And at the same time, so it's exclusive, it's absolute, it's unique. And at the same time, it's also universal. Because that one God and that one Savior will salvation be for all, not just for some. So that's one of the paradoxes of Christianity. Um, it's both exclusivistic or absolute and missionary at the same time. Okay. This, is gonna, this is a puzzle. And people will tend to want to do one or the other. They'll want to either say it's about, they'll either want to tend toward universalism or exclusivism or absolutism without keeping both in tension. And Paul keeps them as always. Both and, good Catholic both and here. Okay. Intention. So there's one God, there's one mediator between man.